Good morning and welcome to our council meeting for the, what are we, the 2nd of December, so um, long for Christmas now, so welcome to our December, first at one of our December meetings, and to open our meeting I invite Francis to join us in the Karen Kiwi. Thank you, everybody. Um, so a rough English translation of our karakia this morning is gather the life force from the land, gather the life force from the sky. With the life force in each of us, we will overcome the darkness. Uh, nā reira, manawa mai te mauri nuku, manawa mai te mauri rangi, ko te mauri kei au, e mauri tikua, ka pakaru mai te pō, tau mai te mauri, haumihe, huie, tai ki. Thank you, Francis, and a warm welcome to any of our uh, public joining us this morning, and the meeting is being recorded. Now, before we move into the agenda, I just want to acknowledge the passing of Tony Murphy, uh, one of our local residents, very committed to the community, and he was a founding uh, trustee for our Manawatu Community Trust, so he will be sadly missed if we could all stand for a moment. So, moving into our meetings, apologies. Uh, I'm assuming Councillor Campbell is joining us. Let's have an apology, uh, at least for lateness, for Councillor Campbell. The mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Hadfield. Seconded by Councillor Short, put the motion, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. We have no requests for leave of absence, so we can move straight to the confirmation of minutes for page <coughs> six with our resolution. I have a mover and a second, please. Your Worship, I move for the minutes of the Council meeting held 18th of November 2021, be adopted as a true and correct report. Thank you. Do I have a second, please? Move. Thank you, Councillor Marsh. I've got the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? The motion is carried. Thank you. Item five, declaration of interest. Any of the items on our agenda today that any elected members need to declare an interest? Councillor Short. Thank you to the Health and Community Trust. Although I stood there as a trustee at the uh, in September, the item I can to talk to us about, I was involved. Thank you. Recorded. Uh, Councillor Matt. Uh, yeah, very proud that my grandson's on the Collison Jump Cube team. So um, I'll be waving and uh, hoeing at him on the screen. So uh, just to let him acknowledge that. Well done. Uh, thank you. Anything further? Thank you. Those are noted. So with that, we can move straight to the public forum. And have we got our team from Collison with us this morning? <coughs> yeah, Good morning. Good morning and a very warm welcome to our council meeting. Thank you. Would you like us to turn our camera on? Yes, please. <laughs> Love to see you. That's a good, oh, here we go. Hang on, hold please. Hold one moment, there we go. Hi, Tim. I'm gonna hand, hand over to these lovely young ladies because it's all about them and they're more than capable of running the show for you. Good morning and welcome. We're really looking forward to hearing about your Jump Jam team success. So uh, over to you. Tell us all about it. Um, well, we started off with trials to see who'd got into the Jump Jam team. And then we were straight away to planning the dance and the name. And once we got the name, we were just full on practicing. It was a lot of hard work. We practiced almost twice a week and sometimes more often and it was really fun. So Paige, do you want to tell them a little bit about the song we chose and the theme? We wanted to go for like a soldier Geronimo theme and like army thing to match Geronimo. So is somebody able to tell them a little bit about what you learned about Geronimo? Um, who he was? So we 
got the thing Geronimo and we had to do a homework assignment on who is Geronimo so we could actually feel the dance and know what we were actually doing so just doing the dance so we learned about Geronimo and who he was and that's how we got our ne ne um, team name. Can you tell us a little bit about Geronimo, who was he? Um, he was a soldier in the Apache Wars. Excellent. And so tell us about the Jump Jam Nationals. How, how about that? How did you feel when you went there and how did that all go? Um, it, we couldn't actually go there because of COVID. So we didn't, so we got them and we sent it in because we couldn't go up to Tauranga. We had to just, it was moved to the online competition. So tell me we filmed it. We filmed it at the Civic Centre with, with friends and family there to watch us. Awesome. And so so how did you get on in the Nationals? Um, well, we came first in the North Island and second in New Zealand. Awesome. Wow. Well done. It's um, the first time that Colleton has ever entered a national team in anything. Um, and yeah, we feel very proud to be the first national team for Colleton. Awesome, and so you should. The photo in the newspaper, all in your costume and your uniform, um, looked absolutely outstanding. So you deserve to win that one. So well done. Anything else you'd like to tell us about it? So what now? Are you going to keep practicing? Um, thank you very much for the grant. We couldn't have done it without you. It's a pleasure to be able to help you. So what are you going to do now? Are you going to keep training, keep working together? Um, no, we're just having a bit of a rest. We've got no other competitions. Little, little did they know that I've, I'm forward thinking this and I've already booked accommodation for next year. So fingers crossed. <laughs> now, that's fantastic. And well done, guys. And yes, you deserve well earned rest over Christmas. So we hope that you do have a great Christmas. And then when you come back to school next year, you'll be able to think about what your theme will be for next year's competition. So please pass on our congratulations to everybody in your team. Well done. Thank you for presenting to us this morning. And it was a pleasure for us to help you in a small way towards the costs of it. So well done and thank you. Thank you very much. It was a, a very, it was a huge, huge help. We really, really appreciate it. Excellent. Bye guys, have a great day. Thank you very much. See ya. Awesome. And if you saw that photo in the paper, they look stunning, all of their red and black. But they, um, it's really well done. Excellent. Right. Uh, so our next item in the public forum is the Help and Community Trust. Have we got our team there with us this morning? Not yet. Not yet? Yes. Yeah. We, so. we do. Excellent. Good morning. How are we doing? Morning. Very good. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to hearing about your tennis court project. So we'll hand it over to you. Oh, well, we just need to share our screen. Yes, sure. So hopefully that works. Um, oh, is it gone? Technology. What? Just go to the actual file. Have you guys got a copy of what was sent through? I can share it. For this uh, yes, we can share it here. Yeah. Okay, That'd be cool. that might be easier. Just give us a minute. Ellie's just finding it and pop it up on the screen. Sorry, Ellie. Oh, yep. <laughs> right, it's there. So, yes, we've Perfect. got it in front of us. Right. Okay. On to that first. So it's me, Rachel Lane, chairperson, and Scott Link later here, who is our deputy chair, um, part of the Halcombe Community Trust, which was established in 2017. And basically, um, it's about coordinating large scale projects that will step change the community. That's what the trust focuses. Um, and we also administer a small community fund. So that's kind of just to give you the background of who we are again. 
Um, we spoke to you at the long-term plan about the Halcombe Community Walkway Network, and we thank you for the support um, that you've put in the 10-year plan for two of those um, portions um, in the coming years. And I guess the trust will just continue to yeah, look for solutions for this to be done a little bit earlier. But yeah, it's great to have that support in that 10-year plan. Um, so with regards to the um, next project that we're focusing on, um, we've looked at, at what sort of the community needs, et cetera, and the tennis courts resurfacing them to a more, um, well, basically a turf, a multi-sport um, facility that can be used by a number of sports, not just tennis. So you'll see there an the aerial shot, it's looking a bit tired. We don't know how old they are, but um, yeah, they're needing a bit of a birthday. Uh, when we looked at sort of why the community needs this, um, I guess the whole of the manual too, as we know, is growing, which is putting pressure on local and regional infrastructure. You guys will know that. Um, and of that, Halcom is one of the fastest growing areas. Um, demand is actually increasing for local facilities as these communities grow. And our school, um, our primary school, is pushed for space um, for further recreational facilities such as the turf. So that has been investigated. Um, as a trust, we've looked at, at um, just a whole new recreational precinct um, in the land that we identified is currently under private ownership. And there's a bit of a challenge with um, securing that. So we're looking sort of to utilize what we've already got um, a bit better. The courts themselves, you know, the location um, is central to the communities and school, um, which means that that usage is actually naturally growing at the moment which Scott will talk about. Um, and it's got infrastructure surrounding it already. So it makes sense to actually enhance them. So there's got toilets there, there's power, and there's a playground right there. Um, and there's a good base to actually, um, you know, the existing courts make a good base, but the asphalt's no longer fit for purpose um, and has, yeah, just cracks, et cetera, in it. Um, and it's obviously not multi-sport. It's only really been, the lines are only for, for tennis and it's only really um, been used for that up until now so what when we think about what the future looks like with the installation on the of a it's actually not a slide sorry Ellie um the future looks like with the installation of a turf you know it's around local children getting access to more sporting opportunities um enhancing the the living for residents in Halcom um especially families it gives more opportunities for adults to be active which we, it's already starting to happen um, and also enhancement of just that general recreational area that already exists. So the domain, um, the playground, the walkway, the rugby field, um, et cetera. And to showcase how sort of community council and school can work together, which we think is a really positive spin-off that would happen from a project like this. So, yeah. Cool. So right, so um, just looking at what we're currently using, the use of the school, of the, the courts, um, yeah, currently the they've opened up a tennis coaching clinic for the kids at school. That started oh, last month with a great start with 35 kids, and that's looking really promising for a whole lot more to come on board. Um, there's also a Halcom Ladies Boot Camp. They're training there Tuesdays and Thursdays, and that's looking really promising as well. The big use is probably also, obviously there's more use for that in the summertime with further tennis from everyone else. But the big one is probably winter time, Currently, um, the school's got nine hockey teams, of which there's seven juniors and two um, senior junior uh, hockey teams, of which those quarter of the, um, scroll down to there, but. Sorry, Ellie, next slide. Yeah. So as you can see, of the 25 junior teams in fielding at the moment, seven of them are made up of the Halcom School. Now, obviously, this puts the biggest problem with this is um, the kids have got nowhere really to train. The task here was a bit hard on hockey sticks and balls and what have you. So, obviously, having a turf just makes it a bit more usable for those those kids to train during the week. Um, there's also seven netball teams which could use this facility um, throughout the winter months, which is you know a big thing for the school. And the other thing is the Halcombe Rugby Club. Are right alongside the park so in wet wet days they can um use the courts for if it's on nature too if they get it for training because the good thing is there's lights already there so 
a, a dual purpose sort of facility. Um, next slide. So next slide. So in terms of oh, that, just basically obviously outdates your plan with what potential uses of, of the course could be. Um, I suppose in terms of costs. Right, I think so. If, if we look at the costs, we've got two quotes. So to start off with, the good thing is the base is already pretty good. It just needs the, the turf to be put on top. And so we had two quotes come back, ranging between 45 and 70,000. Um, so yeah, this is to get it to service to the standard that we want for multi-purpose. So I suppose the big thing is, is our submission is to try and get um, council funding to support this um, of resurfacing the courts and then obviously the, the ongoing maintenance, which hopefully won't be too much, but just like the we need a bit of timber around the base of the courts and things like that, which is standard. So yeah, the big thing is, is we kind of target this re sooner than later and with the aim of getting underway by June 22, if possible. Thanks. So yeah, our submission was for, for yeah in two parts. So the 55 for the resurfacing and then the ongoing maintenance um, to go into the maintenance plan. <coughs> There's already some money, I think, for maintaining them as they are. So that would just look to be an increase. So with regards to um, the collaboration, um, you know, this is a strong community buy-in um, based on a need or driven by a need. Um, we're looking to get support from regional sports trusts like Sport Manawatu and all the groups that feed into, would feed into this facility, the schools community, just to ensure that it is a fit for purpose um, facility for all stakeholders. So if we're gonna give it a birthday, we wanna make sure that it's it's done properly and that it's got longevity. Um, and yeah, obviously looking at funding options, um, other funding options with uh, grant funding, et cetera, and the school input, but yeah. Um, effectively today, because we apologise, we couldn't make the um, the annual plan hearing um, because we had pet day on, which is a very, very important uh, day in the social calendar. Um, yeah, so really we're just here today to, to give our, I guess, um, argument <laughs> um, for for including this in the, in the next annual plan. So that's, yeah, any questions? Far away. Thanks, Rachel. Um, thank you for the presentation. Just clarifying the, uh, the funding of it. So yeah. uh, you, you've got a request in for 70,000, of which 55 is towards the new surface. And the rest yeah. I understand is that maintenance, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. And so my next question is, if in the meantime, um, obviously you're going to try for third party funding, yeah. And so that potentially could reduce the amount you're requiring. Uh, I mean the qu quotes, you know, the the cheapest op surface is forty five plus just. So um, <clears throat> yeah, whether we go with that cheapest option or whether we go sort of middle of the road, um, with regards to quality, um, that will yeah it could decrease um, from that fifty five. Um, for the install, but yeah, it just we're trying to secure what we can from who we can, I guess, first up. And yeah, I, I don't, yeah, we're yet to go through the process of investigating the quality versus the price. So we were kind of aiming in the middle um, with the 55. Great, thank you. Uh, question from Councillor Marsh. Yes, good morning, Claire. Uh, is that for one court or both courts? Both courts. Both courts. Um, and have you got your application under Sport Manawa too? I see they've no. extended the date, uh, but um, this next round's closing very shortly. Uh, we've got uh, someone working on that. Cool. When does it actually close? Um, I haven't got my other email with me, but it came out yesterday afternoon that they've extended it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Any further questions, comments? Councillor Bowski. Yeah, team. Um, there's one um, facility that you said was privately owned uh, on one of those slides. Yes. The, the the land that was privately owned. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was. Um, we were just looking at actually a 
full on recreational precinct. So we're, you know, we can sort of start from Greenfield um, and the land that we identified as currently privately owned. So hence that's been put on the back burner and it's more concentrated on the facilities that we've got and what we can expand on to date. Thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments, Councillor Ford? Thank you. Just following on from uh, Councillor Bilski's question, so the you've got that private potential opportunity on hold. Does that would that complement what you're doing at, at this stage? That can that, that still take place if you go ahead with this one, or are they sort of physically separated? No, they're very close to each other, so I think it all encompasses in the same same plan, basically just improving the hub of Halcombe really and, and getting it to a, a facility that, yeah, people want to go down and it's desirable to use. But it's a very, it would be a very much long-term 10 year plus um, plan. Um, Thank, so, you. Thank you. And the likelihood seems to be getting, yeah, further and further away from that. It, yeah, it's quite challenging. So we're looking at what we can actually utilise in the in the short to medium and potential long term, um, if that doesn't come off. Yeah. Councillor Casey. Uh, it's just a procedural issue now. There's been some comments. Um, as the chair of Health School, uh, I may just become aware of the overall intent of this process. So I'm declaring a very, very late conflict of interest in the sake of the process. Great. Thank you. Um, so, no further questions or comments. Um, Thank you, Rachel and Scott. Um, it's it's really exciting to see um, Halcombe just just flourishing um, with the support of people like yourselves, and to have a vision long term of what you want this to be, and taking it step by step. So we wish you well with your third party funding. Um, we have got that project on the list of our annual plan topics to have a look at. Uh, we're starting those discussions today and uh, see where we get to. But thank you for your time and thank you for your commitment to Halka. Awesome. Thank, thank you very much. Cheers. Have a good day. Bye. See ya. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, it will be part of our discussion later today. <coughs> So we can move to item seven. Have we got Lawrence with us this morning, Ali? Not yet. Okay, let's we'll carry on with our agenda <coughs> until Lawrence joins us. Uh, notification of late items, there are none. Uh, no recommendations from committees. So we can move to item 10, minutes from other committees. Uh, for your information, is the Audit and Risk Committee minutes. And uh, take those as read by Councillor Campbell, so <coughs> if you'd like to highlight. I don't think there is, so you wish it. No? This is. Thank you. Um, is there any questions or comments? None? Excellent. Right, we can move on. So that for our information. Um, now, we won't have the past North Live, so Alex won't be with us yet, is he? He is? Oh, well done, Alex. <coughs> okay, so let's go to 11.1, Palmerston um, North Live Lifesaving Club. This is their 12 month report. Um, as you know, normally these would go to the Community Development Committee. They were unable to join us for that date. So, um, and given that summer's fast approaching, which is their busy time of the year, we brought that to council today. So we're on page 24 of the report. Uh, good morning, Alex. Have we got anyone else? We're just... Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mia. Thank you. We're just, just try, waiting to get visuals so we can see you. Okay. I should have both. At the end. Okay, um, we seem to have it connected here, but we're not seeing you, so... Okay, um, I certainly see um, all of you um, and certainly can hear you, but I've just got a blue screen. <laughs> yep, so have we. So, um... Um, 
So, uh, Alex, have you, you've got your video turned on, obviously. Yes, I've got my video and um, also my obviously audio is on. Uh, I'll try just turning off video and turning it back on again. No, it's not. No, no joy. Um, so, but welcome, Alex. Are you on your own today, or do you have others with you? No, I'm on my own today. I'm just sitting in my office um, here on the Grasslands campus of AgriSearch. Um, so, I'm happy to just maybe just talk to the slides I have, um, if, if that's uh, if that's uh, acceptable. Absolutely. Yes. Floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. And look, first, thank you for the opportunity and look, apology for not being able to make the community committee. Uh, I suppose the last few months and the last, I suppose, 12 months, a bit of a struggle with COVID in and out, uh, reorganising programmes um, to work around that. But um, look, um, just the few slides I've got here I've put together. Um, the Palms North Surf Life Saving Club's been providing a volunteer service down at Himatangi Beach since 1947. So we're entering our 75th year of providing that volunteer service. and. We did have celebrations set for January uh, next year, but we've actually put them off through to the Labour weekend next year, hoping um, there might be a bit more certainty um, around uh, uh, the country at that stage. Um, look, just reflecting on the 2021 season, probably have to say it was an, an average year in terms of um, um, December was not a great month sort of climatically. January was, was very mixed. Uh, we had some good weather towards the end of the season, but again, we'd have to say probably a, a below average uh, in terms of attendance and use um, and sea conditions. Um, so that's sort of a summary, not too dissimilar probably from the year before, um, the, uh, the 1920 year. Um, going through to, and, and to provide that volunteer service on the beach, uh, one of the core activities of the surf club uh, through the year as development and training of um, lifeguards. We added another um, six new lifeguards to our pool um, last season. Um, that was the same number from the previous year. And if I go back to 2002, 2003, we've qualified over 180 lifeguards um, over that period of time. So over the last uh, 17 years, we've added another 180 lifeguards to the pool. And the last 12 months, we added another uh, five IRB drivers, some crewmen and three patrol captains. Um, so we're continually developing and adding to the pool. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that we always cherish is our lifeguards, even if they leave the area, tend to remain active in, in surf clubs um, in other parts of the country. If we look at uh, the activity in the last uh, 12 months, there was two rescues on the beach last season. Um, again, it probably reflected it was a, a quiet season. And again, if we go back, um, uh, both those rescues were by the regional guards. Um, uh, I was actually on the beach for one of those. Um, a father going out to, to try and get his daughter who was in trouble, and he got in trouble, and he got himself rescued. Um, and if we add that up over um, from the support from Manager District Council, if we go back all the way back to 210 to 11, so over the last 10 years, 58 people have been rescued by regional guards um, on the beach. And I just added up all the numbers last night. I went back and added up all the preventions. And a prevention is where you go and assist someone or a group before they get into trouble. So try and preempt um, uh, someone getting to the point where they do need rescuing. Over that last decade, uh, we've interacted with just over 20,000 people, 21,349, if you add them all up over that period of time um, in terms of their role. Um, I suppose we're looking at the club. Um, the club, as I think, is in a good position, is growing. We have a good junior program with more than 20. And to me, that's the lifeblood of the club. Not only brings our next cohort of lifeguards into the system, but critically, it brings the next cohort of parents through, which are critical for the running of the club, you know, committees, um, equipment, training, support. So the club's in a, in a good position uh, in that respect. Um, we initiated a program with schools three years ago, starting with Pinnons with our, from Palmerston North, the idea of growing that. But again, I think with COVID in the last two years, we've just sort of put that, that initiative for schools um, on, not on hold, but um, waiting till we've got a more certain uh, future in front of us. Um, 
um, one of our um, big activities during the year was fundraising on an ongoing basis. Um, last year was a, another big year. We had good support, for instance, from the Manawi 2 for the Drive Club last year. Oh, they actually sponsored us um, with a new IB. Rongatia Lions came to our support last year, Milson Rotary. And again, the big dig, despite um, what was probably trying conditions, the big dig was a big success last year. And we're just working through the process of conversation about whether we actually hold the big dig next year. Um, and we think we can probably do that. Um, we're working with more FN and might attend the two major sponsors around the logistics of that. And I suppose the trade-off is, is between, um, it's a social event that's on a lot of people's calendars um, against just keeping people safe. Uh, and look, just rounding off another ongoing activity for us is just the whole area of buildings and equipment. Um, over the last 12 months, we actually replaced one of the two doors in the surf club that had been vandalized about three or four years ago. Um, we replaced that door over the winter and replaced all the mechanisms in the other door as well. Um, and that was through some support through Stevenson's doors. And um, again, they've been a support of the surf club right through. Um, and I'm just looking at the picture in front of us here. Fantastic job done by the district council and just uh, re-establishing access out onto the beach um, about two weeks ago for the upcoming season. But look, apart from that, I think the club's in good heart. Um, equipment's in good shape. Um, the junior program's growing and sort of we're looking forward to the predictions are uh, uh, maybe a hot, dry summer. Yeah. Oh, that's great for the beach. Not sure if it's great for <laughs> our, our primary industry, but um, yeah, we're looking forward to the upcoming season. And look, quite happy to take any questions you might have. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Um, impressive numbers. And when you think mm -hmm. about over 20,000 preventions over 10 years, you know, that that you need to be congratulated for that because that potentially could have been far worse had there been no guards on duty at the, those times. So um, thank you. So I'll open it up for questions and comments. I have one. You have a sentence in your report that says, we still see the need for more work in the evaluation of the lifeguards. Yeah. Can you just explain that a bit more? Yeah, um, yeah just um, around probably because around with that support is around both provision of service to um, um, to community, but also looking at the development of those those young people that are employed as regional guards. And I suppose we probably pick out the cream of those for the regional guard program. So they're put through extra hoops to be able to fulfil that role. So a lot of their training and development, I suppose, is already done. Uh, and I and it just struggling with maybe some metrics around how we measure their sort of progress through the, the period they are original guard and how we might best sort of just capture that, um, their experiences. And so again, with sort of the ongoing discussion sort of within the club about how a questionnaire at the start of, uh, before they start the regional program and then maybe reflect on that at the end of the program. So yeah, just, just highlighting, we've got, some, we've got some metrics in there, but I think, I think we could probably do better. Okay. Um, thank you for that. And obviously the skills they learn right across the board as well as um, that they learn from the discipline and the work that they do help them to on their CV to get into career paths, so, which oh. is really important. Oh, look, uh, look I think it's um, that on the CV is, a, is certainly a, um, is a huge positive if they've got it on their CV. So I think what they find, the regional guards find that it's... <laughs> They think it's romantic. I think it's romantic to do a weekend patrol, but to do it Monday to Friday, week in, week out, it, 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 it's pretty tough. And so, um, you know, getting up every day and having to do that day in, day out is, <laughs> yeah, I suppose, it's a bit of work experience, but just, um, and actually just dealing with people on an ongoing basis. So I think they develop, you know, it'd be really good to be able to get some sort of sense of their development, particularly interacting with the general public and how that then. Um, that experience impacts on the way they think about what they might do next um, as, uh, as young people. Yeah. Great, thank you. Any further questions or comments from the team? Councillor Humphrey. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, acknowledge the amazing work um, that you guys uh, do, but you particularly, Alex, in, in terms of being a real um, mainstay um, of the club, um, countless hours and um, relentless energy, actually. So really wanted to acknowledge that. I do have one quick question, um, and it's um, really administrative, so more for officers. It's just um, clarifying 
Page 25 notes that the report includes financial accounts to 30th of June, but they're not in our agenda. So I just wanted to confirm that they have been received and that officers were satisfied uh, with the fiscal position of the organisation. Yeah, yes, um, that, that is correct. We have received them and the team have um, been through those and approved them. Yeah, and further on, I think we'll have some orders to count short. We changed our, um, our financial year to align with Surflow Saving New Zealand, so I think you would have got a set of interim accounts that would probably present at the AGM, but we will have there will be some audit accounts when they've completed um, forwarded as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, so yes, uh, totally endorse Councillor <coughs> Humphrey's comments. Um, thank you, Alex, for the time, commitment and passion that you put into it. These young people um, wouldn't get to, to where they are today without the support of people like yourselves. Um, so thank you for what you do and good luck with this summer. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, look, and look, thank you, Mayor and, and, and um, councillors. Uh, we appreciate your support and um, we wish you all a, a very Merry Christmas and a, and a Happy New Year. Excellent. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, let's go back to uh, 7.1, which is the update read the forestry impact on our rural communities. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> if it's helpful, you wish if I'm happy to move that Council received the 12 month report from the Palmerston North Surf Life Saving Club for the period ending 30 June 21. Thank you so much. Seconded by Councillor Ford. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? That motion is carried. Thank you. Right, welcome Lawrence. Uh, just a bit of background, you will recall that uh, our council decided to join a number of councils to do some investigation around the impact of forestry in our rural communities. And uh, so Lawrence has been leading that work. So today is an opportunity for him to update us on the work that's done to date and the findings and where to next. So welcome Lawrence, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you, Helen, um, Mayor Helen and councillors. It's, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, last night I, I circulated effectively a PowerPoint presentation, which I'm, I'm going to quickly take you through. Um, I'll share it on the screen if I get the technology to work, it has before. Um, and then, then I'll take some questions, um, if that's okay with you. It's a, it's a fast moving space, but we are getting to the nub of what the issues are. So is that okay? Is that approach okay, Helen? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I'll just share it. Um, so can you all see that? Uh, no, it hasn't opened yet. Okay. What can you see? Anything? No, um, no you can't just see. Okay, hang on. Just let me go back. It's opened on my screen, but it doesn't seem to have opened on yours. Unshares. Okay. For presentation window, and then shares again because it's it's right. sharing the screen. Here. The technical advice is if you unshare, yes. open up open up your document and then share. Okay. And then share. Um, I thought I had opened it. Oh, I see. Right, just bear with me. I'm sure this is going to work actually for whatever reason. Um, um, we do have a copy here, Lawrence. If you have a copy, can I just talk you through it then? Because um, that's... If you just give us a minute, Ali will put our copy that you've sent us up on our screen. Okay, that's cool. Yep. So just, just bear with us. Okay, so we have the first page up. Okay, I can see that. Um, okay, so, so just first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it, it, it's a fast moving field, as I've said. Um, but I'm trying to give you the most up-to-date information we have. So if you go to the second slide, Ellie. So um, really what this project is about is how councils can control uh, forestry land use if they can, 
how big is the problem and what are the options to manage it. And underneath are all the councils that have joined in this work. Um, as you see, there's 13, uh, a mix of North and South Island, mostly North Island. Um, they, all those councils have put in $5,000 and Local Government New Zealand has put in $20,000 and Beef and Lamb has put in $20,000. Now, um, that we're not sure we're going to use all that money, to be honest, and if we don't, it'll be returned to you on a pro rata basis. Um, but we are, we're well on track uh, to, to getting this work done. We're probably almost halfway through it. Okay, next slide. So many of you will know, and, and I know you'll, you represent the Manawadu district, so, you should, so you'll understand a lot of this, but plantation forestry linked to carbon is now an incredibly profitable business, um, especially in the first, um, first cycle of planting, so the first 25 years or so. And carbon only Plinus radiata permanent forestry, and while you can't register a permanent forest yet, um, if you were to put Pinus radiata into permanent forestry once again and just leave it there, um, it looks incredibly profitable as well. Um, so uh, I'll come into the issues that that causes, but it does look incredibly profitable. And then historic high log prices, particularly from China, are also driving the market. Now, they've come off a bit at the moment, but in the last two years, it's been very high prices generally. Uh, most of the timber um, is not that higher quality. It's generally unpruned, but it's taken to China and used for boxing and other materials for concrete laying and for packaging. Uh, and the demand is significant. Uh, there has been an escalating carbon price. Um, and yesterday, the carbon, the latest auction, they do one every three months. Yesterday, the latest auction price was $68 a tonne. Um, and it has, has risen from $25 a tonne um, in 2019. So a substantial increase in two years. The government expected it to be at $50 a tonne and had a cap on that. They introduced new units into the uh, auction to try and keep that cap working. They introduced 7 million tonnes in September of new uh, carbon that the government had um, and still the price went much higher. So that just underpins that demand is significant. Um, and the European carbon price is much higher than 100 at the moment. I think it's nearly 140. So that, that's a New Zealand equivalent. So you can see that the global price uh, is high. And interestingly, in the September auction, uh, most of the carbon cr credits were bought by corporates that weren't necessarily linked uh, to the carbon market. They, they see it as a significant upside and they're taking a strategic position and looking to, to follow the market up. Next slide. If you look at um, farming profitability, and these are generalizations, but on, on hill country sheep and beef farming, the effective farm surplus uh, is around three to $400 a hectare. On finishing sheep and beef country, it's effective farm service is $750 a hectare. And if you've got some cropping or some more finishing country, you can get nearer a thousand. But carbon at $65 a tonne, bus forestry at the current uh, price, gives you an EFS over the first 25 years of $2,000 per hectare. Uh, and if it goes to $100 a tonne, that's $2,600 a hectare. James Shaw has actually said he believes it'll go over $200 a tonne, and that could be $4,000 a hectare. So that could be, you know, if you went to $200 at the extreme, that's four times the profitability of what is traditional sheep and beef country. And then if you look at carbon only pinus radiata in a permanent regime, you get a very similar result at about $2,000 a hectare. So there are what's called lookup tables. You can go and work out where you live and you can go to the MPI website and it'll tell you how much carbon on average pines will sequest over a 50 year period. And it'll give you the number. And if you multiply that 65 over that period, you can basically plant a farm in pine trees, walk away and collect at Today's value about $65 a tonne, $2,000 a hectare per year for doing nothing. And many farmers on the uh, and land users on the east coast of New Zealand associate that there is less climate risk with planting and using carbon in forestry than there is with traditional sheep and beef production. And that is, that is driving a change. So it's considered less risky. And in that vein, the government also said that if your trees and you're in the ETS if they fall over or are damaged by fire, the government will pick up the loss of carbon on that 
as long as you replant. So that effectively takes out a further risk in that farming system and puts it effectively with the taxpayer. Next slide. What we also know is that um, exotic trees and mostly Pinus radii I'm referring to here, but there are other trees like redwoods and eucalypts and things. They sequest carbon at 650 tonnes um, per hectare um, and at, at year 28. So, so 650 tonnes, they've grown into timber, which has taken CO2 out of the atmosphere by age 28, whereas natives will only do 240 in the same period of time. So effectively, pines are three times more effective at sequestering carbon dioxide and putting it into, into carbon in the form of timber than, than natives are, which is another reason why they're so popular with people planting them. Next slide. So in New Zealand, we have the area of New Zealand is 26.8 million hectares, of which 8 million hectares is in native and indigenous forest. Most of that is in national parks. Um, and then there is 2.1 million hectares. These are 2020 numbers, but there's 2.1 million hectares in exotic forest, of which only a third of that is post 89. So for those of you that don't understand or haven't been in contact with the Paris Accord, effectively what was agreed um, was, and, and Kyoto actually before that, what was agreed that um, the government in New Zealand would nationalize all the carbon credits pre 1989. So as long as you keep trees and keep replanting them, um, you don't need to worry about carbon if those trees were planted pre-1989. Post-1989, you can choose to join the ETS and manage the carbon yourself. You don't have to, and then the government will look after the carbon, but you can choose. But only 33% of the total um, exotic forest plantation in New Zealand is post-89. Interestingly enough, in 2020, there are actually 74,000 hectares less in forestry than 2003. Now, for those of you that have traveled from Taupo to Rotorua, you'll know Graham Hart took all those trees out and put them in dairy farms. There's a bit of that occurred, and then there's just the, the natural um, harvesting cycle. There is only, of that 2.1 million um, hectares, there's only 330,000 hectares currently registered in the emissions trading scheme. So there's a significant amount that isn't. Next slide. <clears throat> there are also been some. Uh, can we take questions? As if, 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 if you wish to do it that way, Helen, absolutely. Yeah, otherwise we might forget the question. Um, Councillor G. Taylor. Um, thanks, Lawrence. Hey, my question was just around this. Um, I'm still not quite understanding. So, is the government claiming the carbon on that pre 1990 land? Like, who is actually making a buck out of that carbon uh, since it's been nationalised? How, how does that work? Well, they basically, they, they've taken um, all that, um, they've nationalised it and, and, are, and are using it um, to, to fund and operate the market. So effectively, all the, you know, anything that's in native or anything planted before that time, um, the government has nationalised and they're managing that um, in a national sense against our liabilities. And I, I'll, I'll come to this later, but in simple terms, New Zealand has been very poor at reducing its gross emissions. Um, they've actually been going up. But what we've got away with is because we've had a whole lot of new, predominantly Pinus radiata that was planted um, pre-1989, now growing and growing and growing to its maximum level, it's sequestered a whole lot of carbon and, and given us a slight reduction in the net emissions. Now, what we've now found is that that can't continue because we've got a lot of trees we've got to harvest um, and not as not so many being replaced. So um, that's a real problem, which is why they announced changes on the 1st of November. So, so, so I, I, in simple terms, they're managing that carbon for everybody. Um, and as the price goes up, one would argue that, um, you know, they, they could get money out of it, but they've got to manage that against our total global emissions and a total profile. Um, so I don't think it's a money thing for them. They just say we are reducing CO2 by taking it out of, of the, the atmosphere and we're using the sequestration in our landscape and all the, all the pre-1989 forests to do so. Thank you. Okay, so then there are policy influences. So the 2020 RMA reforms actually now require councils to consider climate change mitigation and district plans 
regional plans and resource consents. Some councils may have used to do that, uh, but now you will be forced to. Um, and that when those RMA reforms come in, that'll, that'll mean that when you're considering these things, you have to have a far greater focus on climate change. Um, and this year, the Climate Change Commission brought out its final report. And in that, it predicts that sheep and beef numbers will fall in New Zealand by 13.6% by 2030 in the next nine years. Now, that is partly because there has been a slow reduction anyway, as sheep and beef farmers can become amazingly more efficient. So we're producing more protein with less animals, which is great. So the, the numbers are actually dropping. But they've also predicted and put on their... Um, in their analysis that there'll be a whole lot more planting. And this is where, this is where it gets really interesting because what they've said is um, we are requiring in our pathway to become, um, to meet our targets, there needs to be 300,000 new hectares of native plantings between now and 2035 in the next 14 years, and 380,000 hectares of new exotic plantings in the same period of time. Now, when I met with the Climate Change Commission, I said, you're just never gonna plant 300,000 hectares of native plantings. They said, we know that. So what we're gonna do is we've actually included land that's just simply locked up and left to regenerate. And I said, but the problem with that theory is that in a traditional regenerative process, um, you'd lock the land up, the kanuka and manuka will grow plus gorse, uh, and eventually natives will start coming through uh, and you'll get a native forest but that can take up to 100 years. And I said, you can't really count that in the 2035 uh, timeframe. And they sort of said to me, that was a fair point. And my reason for saying that is, I'm worried that in five years time, when those native targets aren't as high as they are, that they'll revisit the exotic one underneath and say 380,000 hectares isn't enough. Now we need to do 550 or something. So I think that's a risk. The report notes that rural communities are threatened if exotic plantings are not managed. So they get it. Simon Upton gets it. Um, a whole lot of MPs get it. A whole lot of mayors and councillors get it. Um, so, so this is about how is that managed. But then on the 1st of November, the government pre-COP26 announced that we've actually increased the target. So net emissions um, have to be reduced by 50% in the next nine years. Now, that is a massive change, a well, massive increase and a massive thing to try and do. So part of that, they've said, look, we just can't plant all of New Zealand in trees. So how we're going to do this is we're going to buy international credits. Now, that's the first time they've admitted that, um, but, it, but it does lead to an interesting conundrum because currently the credits that you generate in New Zealand can only be generated, can only be used in New Zealand. So, for example, British Airways cannot buy a farm in New Zealand, plant it in trees, and take the credits back to the UK. The credits can only be used by New Zealand businesses. They can make money from the credits and take the money back, but they can't actually take the credits. So, so this, meaning we're opening up to others, I worry means that others might open up to us and say, well, why can't we transfer the credits around the globe? And the other thing they've said they're going to do is do a whole lot of overseas forestry planting. Now that is largely being slammed by the forestry sector in New Zealand because many New Zealand businesses have tried this. Um, you've have corruption, you have locals um, using the timber before it's grown for other purposes, including building fences and things. You have fire and disease risk. So I think that while they've said they're going to do that, I think the net result of that will be there will be even more pressure in five years time to come back and plant more of New Zealand farmland. And what we know, we know how to do, and that's Pinus radiata. Next slide. Don't need to read this, it's in your text, but, but what I'm trying to say here is that forestry in New Zealand is a permitted activity. As long as you tell the council, you do a wilding pine calculation and you stay out of significant and visual amenity areas. So even if you wanted to currently, you cannot be in a more restrictive regime to try and ban or control forestry. There is one exception, and that's if you're in a red zone land, which is highly erodible land, and you're over two hectares, you need to get a consent from the regional council. But basically, forestry is a permitted activity in New Zealand. That was after years of lobbying by the forestry sector. So you really have no control at the moment as this is currently written. Next slide. Then there are some other market influences. The Overseas Investment Act was changed in the last parliament 
basically the only overseas investment you can make now easily is in forestry. Um, and that generally is onto virgin farmland that's planted in trees with a production regime. They haven't yet approved anybody just to buy one for, for straight carbon. But every month you'll see there is new farms coming up around New Zealand that are bought by overseas owners. Then is the offsetting regime. Now offsetting basically means what I said about British Airways, but within New Zealand. So Air New Zealand can choose to reduce its emissions or it can buy a farm planted in trees and use the trees to soak up the CO2 and offset its emissions. New Zealand has the most liberal offsetting regime in the world. There, it is unlimited. In the US, you can only offset 8%. So all the rest has to be done for your own reductions. It comes back to what I said earlier, that we've actually been pretty poor at reducing gross emissions. Then there's going to be a change to the emissions trading scheme in 2023, which means there are only two classes of entering forests. One is the averaging, and I'll come to that in a minute, and one is permanent which means you have to guarantee you're going to leave a, a, a forest in, in its state for at least 50 years. There have been other influences, the Billion Tree Fund, uh, that Shane Jones's fund. It didn't make a lot of difference, but it does show how desperate they are to get more, more trees planted. And now we have carbon-only uh, farming companies. Um, New Zealand Carbon Farming is now the largest landowner in the Tararua district. Um, and they, they have done that, I'm meeting with them next week, but they've done that each farm they bought is a limited liability company, which means they can separate the carbon out from the land, and I'll come to why that's important in a minute. The other influence is the increasing price of carbon, um, and for carbon only, it is not covered by the National Environmental Standard for Plantation Forestry. So there are no rules around carbon only farming. You can plant it wherever you like, any class of soil, um, uh, and, and, and even setback distances, fire breaks, none of that needs to be considered. So you as a council would do something about that um, if you wanted to, but I'm not suggesting every council does its own thing. I think a better approach is a national approach. But basically it's completely unconstrained. Next slide. Now, those of you in the farming community will have seen this before, but this basically shows you how carbon is sequestered. So the bottom is the age, up the side is the amount of carbon. Here you're assuming harvest at year 28. So all the carbon accumulates up until age 28. You cut the tree down, the tree sold somewhere else overseas probably, and that carbon is lost from you. And then eventually the roots and the stumps die down, rot away, but you've replanted it and away the thing goes again. Now, if you're in the ETS, you can keep all those credits you generate up to age 28, but then you have a liability at age 28 that you have to pay back. So the forestry industry said, well, we think that doesn't incentivize planting enough. So we want to introduce an averaging scheme. So the green line is the averaging scheme. And basically what that means, you can keep the carbon credits up to year 17, as long as the, the, you keep replanting every cycle and you never have to worry about carbon again. So um, you can get between 30 and $40,000, um, depending on the price, for the carbon per hectare for the first 17 years, and then you have a long-term forest, you never have to worry about carbon again. Now, the net result of that is that, and this has to be on unplanted land, so just open farmland. You can't cut down natives or cut down bush or anything. It has to be on farmland. The net result of that is that has added $40,000 a hectare to the production price over that period, and that's now reflected in land prices. And forestry and carbon and forestry companies are using that money to now compete with sheep and beef farmers. And in Hawke's Bay, it is now quite common uh, for sheep and beef land to be going for up to $17,000 a hectare when it's competing with forestry. So it has made a big difference. Um, and, you know, that is, that is a market thing that's happening. I don't think it's going to change, but it is meaning that farming, you know, forestry has become a very lucrative investment. Next slide. The Labour Party um, promised to change some rules um, after Fifty Shades of Green and the protest on Parliament. And they said a resource consent would be required for forestry on class one to five soils. That's better forestry. Most forestry in, G in New Zealand currently is on six, seven and eight class land. But what is happening is as the um, this price of carbon goes up and they're using this first 17 years, 
A lot of forestry companies now say we want to be on the better land where we can drive over it, we can mechanically thin it, we can mechanically prune it, and it's closer to a port. So they are now competing with good sheep and beef land for trees um, on the basis that it, it's, it's better for them to harvest. And their consent that the Labour Party was talking about was anything over 50 hectares. But importantly, in the two years since that's happened, the market forces now mean that a lot of farmers themselves want to be part of the opportunity. And I know of many farmers that are considering putting up to a third of their poorer land, or all of their poorer land, but it may be up to a third of their farm in forestry. Some farmers are thinking of putting a whole farm if they've got more than one. So what used to be uh, whole farm conversions is now by the market, farmers are now looking at themselves. Next slide. Now, there are some big downside risks. I've only got a couple more to go, but some big downside risks. First of all, the permanent regime. So the permanent regime basically means you um, buy a piece of land or have a piece of land, plant it, and if it's in pines to 1,000 to 1,200 stems to the hectare, that is the most uh, efficient way of producing the most carbon. But what it means is you produce a whole lot of very tall, skinny, matchstick trees, which have no commercial value at the end. Bearing in mind, if you had a production pruned forest regime, it'd be somewhere around 350 stems to the hectare when it's finished. So what happens is you plant those, you have a limited liability company on the land, you collect the credits on one side of the ledger, um, and you know at a 50 year, that, that over 50 years, that can be worth $150,000 on the lookup tables. You collect those credits, and then you go to Hawaii and you sit on the beach living on those credits and you walk away from your farm because the liability stays with the land, not you. So as those trees fall over in the next 50 to 100 years, the land holds the liability. It means the land can become worthless. They'll probably stop paying the rates. You can't chase them for a rate sale because the farm has a negative value on it. Now, that is, a, that is the biggest risk currently in the regime. I think the government is going to try and do something about that, to be fair to them. Um, and that could mean that they either try to bond the credits or um, they take Pinus Radi out of, out of the permanent regime. That's under active consideration. I expect an announcement by that in the middle of next year sometime. So that if you do that, there is a reduction in land value. There is a reduction in counting rating income. And then on the better land, there's a loss of very good class land, which once it's in trees, is highly unlikely to ever go back to something else. The timber industry has also indicated to me that they're really worried that if that is left unconstrained, there'll be a reduction in the prune timber availability. And that'll mean that it's harder and more difficult for sawmills to get um, the product they need. Most New Zealand sawmills have a significant portion of their lumber supply supplied by contract rather than owning it themselves. And if you look at the blanket plantings, because there is no rules around setback or anything else, um, because they're not in the NESPF, uh, then uh, there's a massive associated fire risk, all sorts of other risks. And importantly, there's a massive loss of community. So if you get thousands and thousands of hectares there after each other going into permanent carbon, that there's nothing to be done on them. You just let them grow until they fall over. Um, and so that is a big downside risk. Next slide. So how do you manage this? Well, you can try and control location, scale, and timing of plantings. Um, that's quite difficult, and it will have an impact on property rights. I'm not too phased by that because we have an impact on product, property rights all the time. Um, you know, look at how you control urban expansion, industrial, residential, those type of things. So it is possible. Um, the government wants the RMA uh, to be, they want the national environmental standard to be changed to allow you to have control under the RMA. It's fairly to say I'm pretty cautious about this. And the reason I say that is if somebody comes to you with an RMA consent and says, I want to plant X hectares, or say the thousand hectares in forestry, under the RMA, what are the things that would mean that you could turn that down versus allowing a dairy farm or any other type of farming? And I think that's going to be quite difficult. And most planners have agreed with me when I've said that. I think there's more potential in including the right tree, right place concept into regional planning rules. Uh, and I think that is an active part of our work as we look at the RMA reforms, which are currently going through Parliament. As I said, the government needs to change the permanent forest definition, in my view, to take out Pinus radiata. 
It may need to change the averaging period because what is now happening is as the log prices come back for trees that were planted post 1989, people are delaying harvest and choosing to follow the carbon market. Um, so that, that means that some people that would traditionally harvest trees at between 27 and 28 years may actually wish to go right out to year 50 uh, and simply farm the carbon before harvesting. So that might mean an amending to the period of the for longer rotation of forestry and then amend the um, emissions trading set offsetting. In other words, it is way too liberal and is allowing effectively, in my view, New Zealand rural farmland to become a lung for what is urban um, emissions. Next slide. So you can do resource consents for forestry. I don't think it is appropriate for territorial authorities to do that. Uh, although that's what the government wants to do. So I'm trying to give them advice that I'm not sure that's going to work. You can put minimum areas, you can do around land class differentials. Um, in my view, this should be done by the regional councils, not by the territorial authorities. Um, I do think under the RMA, there needs to be spatial planning for forestry, including to how timber processing plants are going to be supplied. You know, many of these plants are worth hundreds of millions of dollars and they need to get some surety, and I agree with them, that they can actually have some land that's available um, to supply their mills and their jobs into the future. I'm quite keen for us to look at farm forestry plans as part of the overall farm plans. Um, in other words, you, when you do your farm plan, you would identify land that's suitable for forestry. Once that's in your farm plan, that's a permitted activity and the farmer can get on and do what they wish. And the reason I say that is because if every farmer in New Zealand put 6% of their land into forestry, either native or exotics, then we would deal with that 300,000 hectares plus the 380,000 hectares. So in my view, farmers will do this themselves because the market says it's the right thing to do and they'll do it in the best places um, to support their farming, uh, overall farming sustainability. There does need to be a plan change for carbon forestry, and I think that should be done nationally just to give more rules around it. Um, one of the other ideas is that we give people incentives, so a better type of credit for native planting than exotic plantings, bearing in mind natives take a long time to grow and they're not as viable commercially. Um, now that's under active consideration, but, and then sort of are there any other ideas? And I'm happy to hear from you today. The last thing I would say is this. There is only one thing stopping the rate of conversion at the moment. Well, three things, actually. One is there's only so many farms coming on the market. Two, you cannot get seedlings, either um, native or exotics. And three, you cannot get enough people to plant them. Now, if those two, three constraints were unlocked, you would see a mass change in land use very, very quickly. So it's not the legislation that's preventing any of this. It's actually the physical logistical constraints. And we have been told that by real estate agents on the on Southern Hawke's Bay, uh, Tararua and Wairapa, that forestry or carbon and forestry will buy every farm that comes on the market. So that's it, Helen. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a live and viable issue, but... Um, you know, I think we're starting to get on top of some options. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, incredibly useful information to explain for many of us who didn't really understand how it all worked. Let's open it up for questions or comments, please. Uh, Councillor Casey. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Lawrence. Shane here. Hi, Shane. Um, hi. Thank you for your presentation. A couple of aspects. One's a minor. Well, not quite. I'm affected by it. Um, pollen produced by forestry. <laughs> Uh, particularly in the metal too. Um, this time of year is significant. The other, the other uh, point that I want to raise too is, is infrastructure for firefighting, rural. We don't have it. We simply don't have it. And what I worry about is, is the Tatarua district, for example, how would they fight a significant forest fire? Um, so I, I don't think that's not, that's not clear in any of this. You've highlighted it as a risk, but um, is the government aware of that? We simply just don't have the rural firefighting abilities. Yeah, uh, so both points are extremely valid. Um, first of all, um, we don't have a lot of um, pine plantation sort of near Napier and Hastings. 
Right. Not a lot, but I can tell you now that every spring, all our cars, all our houses are covered in pollen. So it's a, it, it is a big issue, and there's lots of people that say it's bad for your health. I haven't got too much into the health aspects, but it absolutely is a nuisance value. Yeah. And the fire one, we are going to meet with the fire service and try and work this out because I think that this is this is one of those unintended consequences nobody's thought about. Um, as you will know, you know, rural firefighting is looked after and controlled by volunteers, um, and they do a wonderful job. Um, but if you have tens of thousands of hectic pine trees, as an example, and you have no communities left with those people that provide the volunteer services, you have just have a complete recipe for disaster. Yeah, absolutely. And there is no there is no rules. Um, so if you're a forestry company and you want to have a pruned regime, the good ones will actually have tracks and dams and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're interested in carbon, and the, bearing in mind the government will take away the risk if it burns down, um, why would you bother? So it's it's basically the Wild West um, if we're not careful. And so absolutely the fire park needs to come in as, as, as part of the regulation. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor G. Taylor. Thanks, Lawrence. I'm a bit charged up about this topic, so... <laughs> I thought you would be. <laughs> hey, um, just a couple of things. So, um, around China wanting to become carbon neutral by uh, um, by 2060, and they want to keep that all in-house, um, from what I've been reading and listening to, is that going to affect New Zealand in terms of our carbon forestry planting obviously they can't take that carbon overseas from what you're telling me but is that going to affect us well well see this is it's a very interesting thing currently they can't take the carbon overseas but when we go to, to another country and say actually um, we want to either buy your credits or we want to plant some forest in your country to offset our emissions the first thing i do with that other country is say well actually why don't you make that reciprocal which is pretty much what we do with every other trade arrangement. And I think there is going to be a risk as we go down that path that they're going to come back to us and say, well, why can't we plant some trees in New Zealand, as an example? And so um, I, I, I just don't know, but I worry about it at, the, at this stage. I think we, we've sort of gone into this um, uh, and, and I don't think we understand the, the, the full consequences. And further to that, with New Zealand wanting, uh, intending on becoming carbon neutral, are we including those uh, pre-1990 trees that we discussed earlier the, um, that was nationalised, that carbon from those trees, is that being included in New Zealand's carbon total? It is. Um, and one more thing, um, are you looking at around the harvesting of forestry? Uh I just see it's really unfair that farmers have to um, abide by the freshwater regulations, yes. particularly around um, stock behind a wire and pugging being five or 10 centimetres. And yet forestry can harvest on moderate hill country without consent and in the middle of winter, creating the mess that they do. And because they have their forest guidelines for plantation forestry harvesting. And so, are you looking at the indiscrepancies between the two sets of rules for both industries? Um, I, I haven't looked specifically at the two sets of rules, but they, they should be consistent environmentally. Um, I, I, I could be wrong, but my understanding is most regional councils now require you to have a harvesting consent, and that forces you to comply um, with uh, you know the, the, what's in the NESPF. So that's... Um, you know, tracks, cutting, debris, all that sort of stuff. Now, that didn't used to be there. It's there now. Uh, in fact, um, John Turkington, you know, who will be familiar to many of you, was over here um, looking at a farm I'm involved with, and he said that they're now getting 30-year consents, which include the planting and the harvesting from Horizon. So, so there is a consenting regime. Um, whether it fully complies with the freshwater, you know, regulations, I simply don't know. Well, it didn't this winter. So unless that's happened um, in the past three months, when I uh, reported our neighbours one, that it did not need a consent because I think it was orange zone maybe. So yeah. I'm just 
Yeah. I'll, look, I'll send you the I'll send you the stuff. Uh, I'll look that up. But yeah, um, pretty yeah. much everything in Hawke's Bay now. Um, I, I need to check that needs a consent. I think for for harvest. So maybe it's different between one council and another. Cool. Thank you, Councillor Hemphill. Yeah. Morning, Lawrence Grant. Here. Um, a um, couple of comments you made, Lawrence. Um, one was um, um, may have been a bit cheeky. One was um, uh, rural New Zealand offsetting urban emissions, uh, which I found quite interesting. And I think in all of this is a hell of a lot of unintended consequences. And nowhere in all of these discussions do, does anybody, in my view, ever pay much attention to Article 2.1b of the Paris Accord. Yeah. And it really concerns me that we're doing a hell of a lot of stuff that actually inhibits food production, which is entirely not the reason of the Paris Accord. And, and if we actually take that one step further on how uh, everybody actually um, quantifies uh, sequestration, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balls up, you know, because if you look at grass and all the other things that farmers have on their farms with sequestering, there's, there's no allowance for all of this stuff and there's no actual allowance for the natural cycle of, of carbon being released, grass growing from carbon, carbon, animals emitting carbon and methane, and, it, and it's a cycle, especially with the short-lived gases. And I find that quite frustrating that, that the whole story is actually not told in these, uh, in these equations. And especially around food production, Lawrence, it's, it's, I think it's, it's nuts. Well, yeah, so so there, there's two parts of that question for me. First of all, um, the, the food production issue is an issue, but we, we've chosen <coughs> as a nation to sort of largely ignore it um, in, in, the, in the thinking. And, and my concern is this, is that if we plant, you know, significant chunks of New Zealand farmland and trees and take out the animals and the protein production, there will be a hole in the market. And another country will simply fill that hole in the market with another type of protein. And because New Zealand is some of the most efficient producers of protein in the world from an emissions perspective, the total global look will be worse than it currently is now. Um, so, so that's a, a big problem. The second problem is, um, and it's not a problem, well, it is a problem, but it's also an opportunity. Technology is rapidly changing. So, in other words, if you're going to be in the ETS, you have to have trees and a canopy area of greater than 30 meters. Now we have drone technology now, and I've been talking to companies where they will just fly over a piece of land <coughs> and using artificial intelligence, they'll work out how much carbon's in there down to very small plots of trees and things. The reason we have 30 meters is when the Paris Accord was done, they all decided that they couldn't get imagery that was accurate less than 30 meters. That's why we have 30 metres. It's not something New Zealand's decided. So as technology gets better and better, including the understanding of what happens with grass and things like that, I think we do need to add a whole lot of other things into the mix, mm. particularly to support farmers who, who actually are now going to be taxed on their emissions when actually they could rightly argue they're actually sequestering carbon on their farms currently, but it's not being counted. So I think that that is a... And this is one of the reasons why I've sort of resisted this big consenting regime, because I think, and this is why beef and lamb's involved, because I think if we can put all this together, farmers will do the right thing, um, we'll get more reduction in emissions, more sustainable farming, and probably more profitable farming if we do it the right way. I think we've always proved, Lawrence, that farmers will actually do the best thing by the country and yeah, do a yeah. better job than any religious part of uh, direction will, will ever achieve. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Humphrey. Thank you. Uh, to now, Gray Lawrence. No um, I need to go back to the beginning. So I have not seen um, the terms of reference and don't have a full understanding of the scope of work that you've been charged with doing. So while this has been really helpful, I guess my question is, um, you know, where does this fit in terms of an overall work program? What are the expected outcomes? You know, next steps. Um, you know, where where are LG and Z in this in this partnership? Just looking for a bit of that, um, I guess, broader strategic context. Thanks. I, I'm I'm happy to send you the, the terms of reference. Um, we have a 
a governance group that's just been formed. Um, it, to be honest, it's taken a while because people have come on in dribs and drabs. So we've now got agreement. Um, with the governance group has been formed this month. Um, I intend to send out a green paper on all these things to all the participating councils um, and before Christmas, so you can have a think about it over Christmas. And then we're going to have a, a summit forum type thing in early mid-February. We're going to bring everybody together uh, probably including the forestry industry to see if we can thrash out what is an appropriate response. Now, the reason we've pushed ahead at some speed is because the government ministers, I've been talking to Minister Parker and Minister Nash about this, they, they want to do something. And what I'm trying to avoid is them doing the wrong thing because it simply seems that, well, we'll just give councils the ability and we transfer the problem from the government to the councils. So, um, so I'm more than happy to, to share that information uh, with you. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it's grown organically, but it's now got a proper structure and things around it. Um, and happy to share that with you. Great, thank you. That would be useful, Councillor Quarry. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, good morning, Lawrence. That morning. would have to be one of the best presentations I think I've heard sitting around a council table. Oh, and it scares me so much, it's unbelievable that the damage that could be done to the aspect of New Zealand life. Um, you know, the, the potential is horrific. And as you mentioned, it's a cowboy um, attitude out there. Money talks and money will call the shots. And when you've got carbon prices the way you're talking um, and, and you compare them with existing standard farming practices, the whole country could go green in a very short time. And, and there's got to be some means of controlling what's taking place. So I congratulate you on what you're doing and uh, yeah, give you 110% support for that. Thank you. I mean, I, I just, when I started this work, I didn't quite understand the, the, the pace of change. And really the work was embryonic, come back to couple of Councillor Humphrey's question at the start, is that I, I said to a couple of mayors, I've watched you write letters and do a whole lot of things, and it's going nowhere. Fifty Shades of Green is going nowhere in, in terms of advocacy. So we need to come up with a plan and some, some strategies. But as I've got into it, the price of carbon's escalated, and the amount of investment going into the sector is escalated, only constrained by the, things, the three things I said. So, yes, it is a real, real risk um, uh, if, if, if something's not done about it. And that's what governments are for. Governments do have to put constraints around things. It can't be, you know, open slather on everything all the time. Thank you. Councillor uh, Council Ford. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. Just you mentioned Tararua, and obviously, um, as one of our neighbours, uh, very affected by this. I didn't see their name on the list. Is it, they... Oh, well, they should be. They are. Um, is that a typo of mine? I know. Yeah, no, absolutely, they are. I thought so. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anything final? Uh, Councillor Marsh. Yeah, Lawrence, good morning. Um, good morning. Can I have some dialogue at some stage too around the actual um, milling industry? Um, you mentioned in there that there's at the moment there's 74,000 less hectares in forestry than in 2003. Yeah. Um, since we basically received your letter earlier on, there's been another two sawmills that have closed down because of unproductivity or profitability. Um, where is the government heading with um, trying to encourage uh, the milling industry, the forestry industry? Um, John Turkington would be a prime example of that. Um, and just what future businesses could be out there um, to actually mill these trees? Or are we um, just going to continue to export um, the greater percentage of this and then import the timber back? Um, because to me, that's just a, a, um, a circle that's open-ended and, and not achieving any goals. Um, surely there must be some incentives out there to, to redevelop that industry as well. Well, um, I, I can't comment too much on the incentives um, because, you know, entering incentives to keep mills open and things hasn't generally worked that well. But what I can comment on is that MPI and the government, this is where they come back to spatial planning. They've identified where the big mills are. They've sort of identified the areas that need to support them with timber. Um, and then they, they, they know that the jobs that flow with that. But at the moment, a lot of that's been thrown on its ear because China will just take anything 
that we can largely grow. And so um, a lot of these smaller mills can't compete, um, can't get a good enough product. Um, so I've met, you know, a small mill in Wairoi, you know, that they've sort of got enough, but but it's a constant battle for them. Um, and, and I, one of the things that, there was an article about three weeks ago in, in the press, I just haven't got it on me, but it indicated that China could become self-sufficient in timber in the next 20 years. Now, if that happens, where are all these trees and where are all these logs going to go? And then in theory, you would say, well, we should grow them into proper timber. We should grow and use that timber to produce as much of our construction as possible because when it's in construction, it's locking up the carbon. So while it's not going anywhere, um, so there's a whole big sort of argument around that. Um, where does the milling industry fit in, particularly on your coast, as my understanding, most of those mills have either closed or about to close. And when I was in New Plymouth, they basically said that 90% of all the timber in the Taranaki went straight out to port. It was, wasn't even used. So, so you've got a market in China uh, that is competitive. That means that a lot of mills can't compete in New Zealand. Um, and, and I think that's, that's a big problem for the industry, which is why the forestry industry wants some more strategic planning around where the trees grow, around mills and things. Because if you get a, a significant am amount of pruned timber, then you can have a, a viable milling industry. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I think we probably need to wrap it up there. Um, you've explained next steps. So we will get another update from you prior to Christmas. You'll send the terms of reference uh, about the work that you're doing. And then in the new year, there'll be an opportunity for us to participate more. Correct. Absolutely. And I'm hoping, I mean, I'm hoping to do that in, in person. So it's probably going to be in Wellington at the Bremen Hotel or something like that. If we can't, we'll do it by Zoom. But but I just think um, we have to get everybody in the room with the latest information and try and see if we can sort this. Um, because as I said, it is, it is, the government is wanting to do something quite quickly. Um, and I just want to make sure they don't do the wrong thing. So is your intention to have government um, people involved in that? Yes, discussion? yes, yes. Great, excellent. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for the... Okay, hour. Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. You too. Talk to you soon. Okay, I'm conscious it is time for a break, but we do have the Manawatu Community Trust. Tyson, looking to you for a lead, please. We are due for a break now. Um, how does that fit if we took a 15 minute break now? How would that work for you and your team? Uh, it's fine by me, your worship. Um, Kevin's online, so I don't know if he works for him at all. Yeah, no, I can cope with that, Tyson. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Right, let's have a cup of tea. Uh, so, meeting a team for 15 minutes. Yes. Um, you've been enjoying the last couple of days. I haven't made it. There should be a bounce. Start of the century. We can't have 450,000 people going to vote. Jules is still close. I doubt that's fine. Jules is not. That's it. You look at him. Right, let's reconvene our meeting. Uh, we're up to a nice item 11.2. This is the Manawatu Community Trust Annual Report. Um, welcome, welcome Tyson and Kevin. Um, 
at the beginning of our council meeting, we acknowledged the passing of Tony. Um, and uh, so our sympathy is, uh, and condolences have gone to his family, but also to you and your team at the Community Trust, because he's been there since the start and a fantastic contributor to what you achieved. Uh, so we've just acknowledged that today as well. So we have your annual report. Uh, we've read it and you're welcome to take us through and highlight anything. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I, I also had a starting point of uh, Tony's contribution, but you've covered that off, so I won't go over that again. Um, the annual report also notes that um, John Culling, Mary Ann and Colin, three of them uh, retired there and they were there from the start. So I just wanted to acknowledge their massive contribution and dedication to the trust. And we're, we're into a, a different space now without them. It's um, the uh, the uh, learning ropes are off now. It's uh, up to the rest of us. So it's um, been a bit of a transition there, but um, we build on all the hard work that they've done. Um, the main points really are the Cleveland progress uh, that have been made. So it's really good to have got that underway. And um, you, you, I'm sure you've seen the work that's happening there. That's looking to be finished around the end of April, Kevin, next year? Uh, April, May, yes. April, May. So um, in thanks to Colspec who have been very pragmatic about um, things and been able to keep things on track despite all the roughly on track we're only about a month behind but that's pretty good given the building sector where it's at and we've always got a building consent for current court I understand there's still some it's the site that keeps on giving in terms of little hiccups that occur on there but we're getting closer and closer so I think all of that actually helps the um, forestry situation because I think that means we're sequestering some carbon so I think that's a little that's going to be helpful there so um, either that or we should just plant some trees on those sites perhaps um, <laughs> um, the only thing to really highlight is that these are draft accounts I'm sure you're all aware that it's hard to get any auditors to um, stay on time around this time of year same as last year so we are expecting to have things finished pretty soon and then we'll deliver a final set of accounts to you early next year um, that's what I really wanted to to highlight and happy to take questions. Excellent, thank you. Kevin, is there anything you would like to update us with more along the day-to-day? -day? Well, and also another question around your tenants' wellbeing, given COVID and uncertain times. A tenants' wellbeing um, hasn't really been a, an issue, and so we'll take that as, as good news. Uh, we have had a slight increase, I suppose, in the turnover of, of tenants. Um, a couple have died, not obviously from COVID-related issues, but, you know, just time takes that, that toll. Um, and a uh, number have, you know, advanced, I suppose, to full-time care rather than um, being able to, to look after themselves within our flats. The only um, obstacle, suppose as you'll see when we talk about the um, statement of intent is that we were ambitious in um, planning maintenance um, last year which uh, didn't occur and it's mainly related to, to COVID delays and things like that. Okay excellent thank you. Um, are there any questions so far on the uh, reports? Councillor Short. Uh, good morning. Um, I was just wondering how are you tracking on your healthy homes um, upgrades um, with the deadlines and things? Uh, government hasn't extended any dates due to all the industry and COVID delays at the moment. We have a, a plan to, we're able to deliver the healthy homes requirements over a three year period. Um, there are we bring every um, vacant property up to up to speed. And as I alluded earlier, we've had our turnover has been a little bit uh, ahead of what we, what we normally do. And so consequently, um, the requirement is that when a, a flat or a new tenancy commences, we have 90 days in which to, to bring it up to the, to the standard. And so uh, vacant um, flats get priority We've now done, uh, as of yesterday, I think it was 35 out of the, the 200 that we, we need to do. So we're ahead of what we had uh, scheduled. I think our targets to um, 
the target for June 22 uh, is uh, 55, and we've done 30, 35 so far of that. And our main constraint, Kevin, is really around as long as the heat pumps come into the country, we oh. should be able to keep to that timeline, really. Yes, we haven't had any delays in the heat pumps, fingers crossed, so far. Um, the, the biggest delay, and we've got a good um, company now installing them, um, we have a little bit of problem getting, I was going to call labourers, but no tradesmen to um, to do the ancillary work like electricians and um, and carpenters, basically. Great, thank you. Any further questions or comments? <coughs> oh, Mr. Short. Yeah, Alison again. Uh, and with the Cleveland upgrade, is it um, likely to be fully tenanted, or are you still looking? Um, for those, uh, are, are there some vacant sites within there, or you're comfortable that it's going to be fully tenanted? Well, from our perspective, the uh, health centre um, are the major tenant, and so it's not our worry. So they're no, no, taking all the space, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. So there'll be an extension, no doubt, of DHB services, etc. cetera, yes. under, under the other guidance. That's right. Yeah, and there are a couple of other small spaces left over, but the FHC has decided they'll take those and they're likely to need them for their own purposes. Or I find a subtenant. Mm. Reflection, it's it's uh, proof that it was the right site, considering some of the other sites that were considered many years ago and was quite a lot of community debate about. So um, it, it's definitely the right site. <coughs> and I think to further support that, there's thoughts in two or three years' time, there may need to be another expansion on there in some way. So that and site still allows for that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Looking to the statement of intent, I'm just looking to Lynn, is this something that you will update with um, NCP and uh, bring that back to us, or is it the intention to roll that over, maybe Michael or Lynn? Um, you, you'll, you'll be receiving that um, in February or in February um, so as the draft and okay. then, then the final June. Great, thank you. So was there anything that you, you mentioned the statement of intent, was there anything in there that you wanted to um, highlight, Tyson? Uh, no, I think it's best left to audience. We're trying to put some new measures in there, so we are trying to refine those. And we're also looking at refining some of the capital program in there, but we'll be able to get that bit more detail to you um, early next year. Excellent, thank you. Um, so once again, um, thank you. Congratulations on the great work that you've been doing to date um, and the, the work, Kevin, that you and your team do on the ground with the residents. It is a trying and um, unsettling time for residents, particularly those on their own. Um, so thank you for the support. Um, and, and the work that you do. So unless there's any further questions or comments, we do have a recommendation on page 30, if I could have a mover and a seconder. Councillor Hadfield. Yeah, Your Worship, uh, happy to move that the Council Community Trust Annual Report 2020-21 be received subject to completion of Audit New Zealand sign-off, and that the Council note that the Audit New Zealand feedback will submit it to the Council's information of the next available meeting after a seat. Excellent. Uh, seconded by Councillor Ford. I'll put the motion, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against. That motion is carried. Um, so once again, thank you for joining us this morning. Apologies, we're a bit late in receiving yours uh, this morning. Uh, we wish you well over the festive season and hopefully you and your team will get a good break and look forward to working again with you in the new year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> sounds, sounds like Tyson to it. Right, excellent. Uh, right, moving on to 11.3. This is the application of common seal. Uh, Shane, are you going to take us through this? It's pretty self explanatory. Uh, really it's just to uh, part of the application of common seals, we need to notify council when the seals applied. So it's, uh, What's happened since June virtual last month? Except for one fencing room. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Quarry. 
Yes, yeah, so I was just going to ask about the thinking agreement. What's, what's that about? Yep. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, usually, a fencing agreement is when we um, something or a piece of standing council is involved, and I think that might be one of my to do with that. Those A and B, one A and one B. Uh, what, essentially, what it means is that um, council is an upper house and held accountable for having up a fence and a boundary for a wheel roads piece. Of Generally, that's um, one inch. Otherwise, we'd have to. We put a road in for every property that front of the road is it would be up technically under fencing at half the cost of every fence. So we put a fencing agreement so we are excluded from that cost. Okay. Very similar to a developer doing subdivision, they always have a fencing covenant, usually have a fencing covenant in so that to so that they don't need to contribute to the cost of <coughs> half, half the cost of each new fence that goes in. Fencing just it overrides the internet. Thank you. Uh, any further questions on any of those comments? Otherwise, we do have a recommendation on page 64. I don't expect you to read out the full content. Uh, do I have a mover and a second one? Councillor Ford. Actually, I'll move the following schedule of sealed documents be received as the uh, schedule there. Thank you. Um, a second, please. Councillor Casey, thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Um, against? That motion is carried. Thank you. 11.4, uh, this is local government official <coughs> information. The meeting at request, this is for the month of November. Um, we have the information in front of us. Um, you have the responses or the progress of where we're at with some of those requests. And uh, Shane, is there anything you wanted to highlight there? Um, there was nothing to highlight. I'm not going to straightforward. They even take questions I'll ask if I can and then make the first bit of the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shaw. Um, the designation of the, um, the land at the West River Treatment Plant covered the entire site. And therefore, the questions that's come from the neighbours very clear. Means it's that first designation covers everything that happens there. Well, we don't have to be separate designation. That's my understanding. Yep, um, it's really your wish. It. Um, <clears throat> that particular inquiry from our friends down Bonus Road, conflating the, the designation site for the wastewater plants and the designation for the resource recovery centre, which are different designations on the same. Uh, adjoining land, <coughs> so uh, their, their concern was that they they were an interested party through the wastewater treatment plant, and therefore by default they would be an interested party through the other, which is not the case. And so there were was essentially clarifying that. And as a response, we we, we gave them information. About that. And is that because of the distance away they are? That's that's right. The, the designation for the resource recovery centre and the effects of that um, it's largely around traffic. Um, Woods as opposed to discharge, which is a source consent for regional process. So I think that, if I'm being honest, they probably got themselves um, either confused or just unsure of the of the discussion. So we heard that one that's really important. Councillor Casey. Yeah. Um, so after the, the, the Gordon Man response there from Council, has there been any further correspondence uh, of what we've provided for them? Uh, no, I've, I've been through your worship, I've not received any further follow-up. Um, and we had the, uh, the annual liaison group meeting for the Wastewater Treatment Plant since we the neighbourhood group were um, represented and we've had a good discussion. Excellent. Right, any further questions or comments? Councillor Shaw. Um, just to clarify, the only one just to update, um, we had some requests previously about the process, getting a process where uh, governance were included in these Lagoima requests where it was appropriate, when it was information regarding elected members. Um, just reporting, we do have a really good process now. Um, I'm alerted of when a request comes in and if it's relevant um, for elected members, have the opportunity to go through the information that's been pulled up based on the request and have an opportunity to have some input into it. So that is working well. Anything further? Otherwise, we have a recommendation on page 67. 
the report detailing the requests for information received under the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act 1987, of November 2021, be received. Thank you. Moved, seconded by Councillor Short. I put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? That motion is carried. Thank you. Right, we have no late items, uh, which takes us to the motion to go into public excluded. And I'm happy to move that the public be excluded from the following parts of the proceedings of this meeting, namely the confirmation of minutes. Uh, moved seconded by Councillor Ford. Put the motion, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? That motion is carried. Thank you. We'll just take a moment to... Is the live streaming 